you are doing the good part. You know, you're bringing the voice of humans and people out there who will use your product or services and changing the hearts and minds within your organization to do the right thing. And you're bringing the data, which is like even more powerful, right? Database decision making, it's amazing that, that you're doing that. So I think all UXRs are doing for good. When we, when we say social good, it's more about the societal challenges that we all see. Um, some of us get to experience it. And, you know, and then we, we get an opportunity to actually practice in that space and do something about it. Um, so I think the Expo Social Good kind of has that bent a little bit towards it. And before we get into more details about about the space and the both and the work that both of you all do, I uh, would love to hear a little bit about how you made it into this space, the story of your your journey, if you could share. And Paish, maybe you can get us started. Sure. So uh, it um, my story starts and my journey starts with a failure. Um, so uh, I did my undergrad in computer science, um, and during my undergrad, I was this person, right? Algorithms are going to save the world, right? Um, and I saw this documentary um, where, you know, we are throwing so much garbage and trash into landfills, and it's just eating up our space. So I thought, why don't I do something about this? And um, And so I designed this, like, genetic algorithm, solving traveling salesman problems, blah, 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 lots of computer stuff, geeky stuff that essentially tells people that, hey, you don't have to get rid of your old microchip or your processor just because there's a new one out in the market and it's a shiny thing to get. You can reuse and repurpose the old one. Um, so I built this, this whole thing. I showed it to people and nobody used it. Nobody wanted to use it. Um, and obviously, because I never did the user research, is it what people want? Is it a real need? Um, and I realized that, you know, having the latest microprocessor, microchip, gives you bragging rights. It's it's kind of like social capital, uh, in some ways. And so, I realized I need to I need to dig deeper here. Um, so I decided to pursue that further. So moved away from computer science, um, did my master's at Berkeley, looked at Hispanic immigrant children. How do they learn languages and how can we design games for language learning for them? Uh, I was still not out completely in the HCI, human computer interaction or UX space, so to say. Um, and then I decided to push further and I did my PhD at Cornell and I decided to design um, tools for detectives because they get biased as they're solving crimes, um, especially if African-American men, you know, Hispanic men, they get put behind the bars a lot more for crimes they never committed. Um, this was before it became really sexy, you know, to, to talk about this thing and work in this space. Um, and I realized that the challenges are really huge. These are really, really huge challenges. There's cognitive biases, there's cognitive challenges, there's technical challenges, there's social challenges. There's just so many challenges. And if we do not understand humans, we cannot solve the problems. So I need to start there. So I went completely like 180 on that, uh, starting with computers first, ending up with uh, starting with humans now. And um, that's been my journey. And I, it has taken me through three continents. I'm a literally th third culture kid, India, Europe, and the US now, and have been at a couple of places, universities, industry, and I think it has all been kind of a small combination, bits and pieces of this that has led me to where I am. And I'm just excited about what's all in store for us. Something that comes through as you're speaking, Tesh, is sort of the passion, right? Like the passion to pursue, identifying something that you really want to work on um, and then finding your way even at Google then you know like we met and I saw that passion I was like I want Tash to work on my team and that's how we ended up working together um, and that's something a lot of people bring up when they're asking me how do you get started like I'm so passionate about this topic and when they ask me how I started it's a little bit opposite I knew mostly what I didn't want to work on so some of you getting into user experience research might have a background in human factors. That's what I went to school for. 
and a lot of the work in human factors ends up being for military, um, both in aviation, but also in, in the weapon industry. And I was like, okay, that's my line. I don't want to contribute to that. Um, I don't want to work on that space. So my job prospects got really, really small. Um, and then one of my, my still best friends um, is an electrical engineer and she went to work for a gaming platform. And I really thought about that as well. And I was like, I also don't want to work on anything related to entertainment. <laughs> it's just, I felt like that's not what I wanted to contribute, what I was learning and sort of what I can do for society. So I always looked for, I guess, the longest route to get to the areas where I, I could work on because I basically had really clear the areas where I didn't want to work on. Um, so I finished my master's in human factors and I worked in in the aviation, but in the commercial aviation space. And in my research, something that kept me going, it was very boring. Um, I actually had to measure uh, how long it will take people to M plane and D plane and airplane to make a change in the plane. But being in airports for a long time, I realized that I was getting excited when I saw people like see, you know, when you see that moment in airports when people see each other and they hug. Um, and I was like, oh yeah, this is why I'm doing this work. You know, I was able to find the connections to the things that were meaningful. And that's what motivated me to continue doing my work. Um, so I continue also a doctorate degree in Europe where I work for TomTom. And to me, the, the connection there was like, oh, helping people find their way. And you know, as, a, as an expat living in Europe and someone living in Amsterdam where you can see a lot of tourists, it's very palpable that you're working on something that you're helping people with. Um, and so when I came to, to Google, um, I was actually working still in the area of transportation and communication and the opportunity to work at Jigsaw came up and I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about um, this very particular space of social good in technology, um, all the topics that Tesh is more or less an expert on, um, but they gave me an opportunity. I think I showed that I really wanted to learn and applied all this skills and knowledge that I collected on the other topics on, on this very specific area. So that's how I got really mostly dedicated to it. And, and it's something key for me, right? Like all of us, when we interview and we're, we're talking with companies that are trying to get us to work for them, um, it's very clear, like I need to work on something that's mission aligned for me because that's what really what motivates me. Yeah, and like to add to that, Dolly, I, I completely agree with that. And I definitely missed out on the parts where I joined Google and I did not join Jigsaw. I joined Google Ads and I worked in ads for one year. Yes. And then I worked in cloud for a year um, before I ended up in Jigsaw. So yes. and you know like you crowd. find your way, right? Yeah. If it's something you really want to work on, you, you find your way. And we'll talk a little more about things that you can do to get there as well. But it's everyone that works in the space definitely has a path getting to it. Yeah, before we keep going, I just want to remind, you know, folks who are joining the call, like if you have questions, we want to we want to hear from you. So drop them in the Q&A. Um, I'm, I'm moderating uh, all the questions, so we'll, we'll take them up as they come. Um, and, you know, this was a great, great setup. I just loved hearing the stories of how you guys got where you have. Um, I'm curious as a researcher myself and hopefully others on the call as well. Uh, what is the role of a UX researcher in this like UX for good space? What does that look like? Yeah, I can start a little bit and then Tesh, please add to it. Um, yeah, if I go back to the way that we thought about sort of like doing UX um, and the role that we all have in improving social challenges, um, I think you can do that no matter your industry. And something very specific is um, one of your superpowers, I would say, and we'll talk a little more about this later as well, but something that keeps coming up is the ability you have to ensure that whatever topic, whatever product you're working, whatever company that you bring a diverse set of voices to design the products and services that you're working on. And you get to do that for your job, right? So even more than the earlier definition of anyone working in UX, anyone working in UXR has this opportunity of bringing this voice into the product design cycle. So one specific example, and um, an area where Tesh is currently working more on 
is in the gaming industry. So you have something well known is that it's a very toxic environment, um, but it's not equally toxic for everyone. And it has been identified that women, for example, get a lot more higher rates of being targeted and harassed than even dogs, which is taking the digital harassment to the real world harassment. So the researcher, if you're working in gaming, you're like, well, you know, what's the connection with social good? Actually, you can bring the voice of people that are experiencing the product. And it's a pretty nefarious um, way of experiencing something that's supposed to bring you enjoyment. Uh, you can bring those voices and you can you are the connection to a team that's developing new things. And you could have this opportunity to change the course and um, speak to them and convince them and let them know like this is happening and maybe using design thinking to brainstorm of ways that we can change that. Um, so yeah, it doesn't stop with recruitment. There are actually more things. So we can do that's just one example. Yeah, I completely agree with Dali. Like uh, recruitment is super important, has so much impact. And as UX researchers, we all know that, right? So being mindful is great. I'm going to borrow Dali your idea about superpowers and I'm going to like go one step further. I'm going to be like, UX researchers are like superheroes. They're like, my in my world, they're superheroes and they have so many superpowers. And, and I think it's maybe the role of a UX researcher, maybe just we, as we are in terms of personality, I feel like we are the people who, who generally have lots of empathy. Um, and we have empathy towards people who will use our products, who will use our services. We have empathy with our stakeholders and we have this power to, to tell stories um, and to change the hearts and minds of our stakeholders. And it's a superpower to have right because we develop this either by training or just by personality we have this and we can use this superpower to guide decision making um that can change complete strategies we do not end up launching products that would be bad for humanity or we do end up propagating this idea that we should pursue further on this product because it will be good for humanity um and i think that's really great um, I think another thing that I would say is um, just realizing that societal problems are really hard, accepting and recognizing that you're passionate, but these are really complex, hard challenges and you cannot do it by yourself. Um, so either spend a lot of time in finding other folks who are passionate about it, exactly have empathy and want to join forces and hands in solving these problems um or mentor like mentor them mentor a diverse group of future generation of ux researchers who get their hands dirty in doing ux for good and are ready to you know get the hit the road running when when they needed the most Yeah, thank you, Tesh. And I'm curious, like, you know, as, as we're moving through this, if there are like specific examples of work either you've done or you've seen where, you know, this tech for social change is anything that you'd like to share? Yeah, I guess I can start first this time. <laughs> um, so um, as I lead the online harassment portfolio at Jigsaw, what that means is essentially um, we try to reduce um, toxic conversations online and we try to promote healthier conversations online. As Dali was, was pointing out, right, that there are certain groups of people who are, you know, significantly more at the receiving end of toxic conversations um, online and fortunately offline as well. Um, so within that online harassment space, I do a couple of things. For example, I lead research for a tool called Perspective Perspective is a group of machine learning algorithms. It's an API um, that can read a piece of text and tell you how likely it is to be toxic by giving it a score between zero and one. Um, the way it's being used around the world is in how um, comments get moderated under web platforms. So if you go to New York Times, for example, which uses Perspective, um, 
if someone were to write a toxic comment, you know, um, perspective is used to detect the toxicity level of the comment and then bump it up or down the queue of the moderator who's going to moderate that comment. So it, it aids in the moderation process. Um, on the other hand, besides helping common moderators, you can also see, can we help people who are writing these toxic messages? So can we just reduce the generation of toxic messages itself? Um, we called it work authorship feedback. And what we did was we use a social nudge theory. So we partnered with a couple of external partners like Coral, OpenWeb, and they run common moderation for platforms for like hundreds of websites around the world. And what we thought was, can we give people a tiny little nudge that they're writing something toxic as they're writing it using perspective? Um, and really the idea comes from this, this real belief that I've always had that Humans in general are not terrible, at least most of them. Sometimes they find themselves in terrible situations, they end up doing something terrible. Um, so when they're writing these toxic messages, they are not as inherently to toxic humans, they're toxic messages. So the action itself, focus on the action. Um, so we did this experiment where, where you know, we gave out this message, a nudge to a person as they were writing a toxic comment. And we found out, and we ran this experiment multiple times, multiple locations. Um, we found out that just giving that nudge reduces toxic comments by 35%. Um, that's a big, massive decline in the number of toxic comments online. Uh -huh. And we, we published a blog about this, et cetera. So that's the kind of stuff that ends up going in my world around UX for Good. Dali. Uh -huh. So exciting, those projects. Um, something I'll add on the New York Times project, because we worked on it together, was that um, by helping moderators help them moderate the content, because we reduce the amount of work they have to do, basically, they were open able to open more news articles for comments. Because like, an example on the New York Times platform is that not all the news articles are open for comments. Um, and their own research, they found that um a lot when there was toxicity on the comments a lot of women actually will stop commenting so when they were missing that perspective by having um this project collaborate with them it, it allowed them to open more um articles and have more voices present so it's a really cool project and i actually work on something very similar now um it's also related to content moderation Basically, trust and safety is the engine of Google that manages all the content, ensuring that what ends up being in our platforms um, abides by our policies. And there's a lot of stuff that doesn't abide by those rules that either our ML systems catch or that people flag. Um, and actually, yesterday, I got this email. When, when something like this happens, everyone gets an email. So the platform we're working on as a UX team is to ensure that the work that the moderators are doing, it's um, easier, you know, all the good things that UX brings, a better product, easier to use. It also reduces the complexities of doing this type of work, which is sometimes um, difficult to watch a certain content that they have to moderate. And uh, one specific group, it's able to sometimes report the content that they see to the authorities. So this particular content, um, there were photos related to in the child safety space um, that they were shared with the with the government agency. And actually, by 11 p.m. the same day, um, they were able to catch a person that had a four-year-old that was being sexually abused. Um, so obviously, those are the kind of things that are make me wake up every day and and continue working on this space. Um, they, my role is really small, right? Like the, the job is actually from the person doing the content moderation, it's all them, but but my work enables their work to, to happen. So that's kind of what, not every day, but one really good day, what it looked like for me. Thank you so much for sharing those examples. I think it's it's, it's at least for me, it's a little bit different from the kind of work that I, that I see, uh, you know, UX research and so it was so good to hear. 
Um, one question that I had myself before we move on to the next topic, um, and, and this is, you know, when you're in research, right, and when you're in UX especially, uh, we're asked a lot of times to show the impact of the work. Oh, great, this is this is great for the users. What's the impact of this to the business? Mm -hmm. And I work in ads, I especially have to face this on a day-to-day -day basis. So I was just curious, like, it, is that different for this space or do you have to navigate those conversations? What does that look like? Tesh, Tesh will say, he will always make fun of me because I think for like the first six months that we worked together, I was like, metrics, 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 Tesh, we need to do it's so hard to show the i mean you're always you're fighting for your role no matter where you work so i sympathize everyone goes through it but when you're working on products that don't make money and that maybe they're changing the they're changing people's lives but it's two people and they're in afghanistan <laughs> um it becomes difficult right to just to prove that you're you're incrementally doing this change so something we worked on a lot is to try to figure out what are those metrics? And can we all agree that those are the things that we're working towards? Because you know the, the stories of the, those things happening, like I mentioned before, are not the everyday, right? Like we can't just base all our work. It might take years until something like that happens. So what are those metrics? So it's really, really difficult. Um, maybe Tesh, where, where have you guys landed since I left in the metric space at Jigsaw? <laughs> Any advance one or one thing left when I left? We love metrics. Have I touched a nerve, Dish? <laughs> let's see, let's see. What can I say? Um, uh, we love metrics. We have always loved metrics. You know, sometimes metrics make it all the way. Sometimes they don't. And like, it's it's always like Dali said, like it's a it's a constant challenge, right? Because because like you are showing the impact of your work. But at the same time, you're also proving your value prop as a person at the table, right? What is it that you're bringing? How is that having that impact? Um, sometimes it is those two people, but it's sometimes also not considered enough. Um, so in those in those days, I think what what ends up happening is, and it'd be great to have those metrics if there are. But in those days, it is great to send out you know, these newsletters, these announcements, you know, that don't discuss one outcome because UXR was there and their impact was measured, but actually leveraging the entire UXR community there, right? Because you make because you're making the case for the entire UXR community, essentially that having UXR is important. And this is all the benefits that come when you have a UXR. Um, it's also really, really hard in some ways to prove your impact because if everyone is safe no one dies how do you prove your impact it's kind of like being a police officer right you prevent a terrorist attack everyone is safe does that mean that we don't need police anymore um so i think you need to kind of remind people that there are analogies between what you're doing and what other similar roles are out there and tell those stories that if you did not have a UXR for this project or a similar project, here are the failures that have happened in other projects in the past. Um, so tell them what are the shining examples of what having a UXR has done and also show the failures of having the absence of UXR. That maybe that will help. And one thing that we just hot of the press something we're discussing as my team um is actually exactly this right um and one of the conversations we were having it's like okay our work is meant to reduce badness on the internet and, um but it's a percentage of what what is the total badness <laughs> you know so we're dealing with really deep topics um it's something that we've done a lot of jigsaw and that we also need to continue doing more in my space is work with academics or with with people, philosophers, you know, people who are actually thinking a lot about this problem and break it down to more concrete things that we can borrow um, and measure against. But it's not going to be your engagement click through rate. You know, it's, those are the, the kind of like the classic UX things. We can't borrow any of those. Um, but yeah, you get creative. Um, Tesh is really good, for example, coming up with with cool names for frameworks um, that we end up using. <laughs> 
yeah, and you're measuring on on those scales as long as the whole team, you know, like we have strong partners in PMs and 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 your leadership team is supportive, you come up with different metrics and you kind of like track progress against that. Um, and that's also a way where some of the projects don't make it, um, and we have to kill them because we try to quickly learn that we're not hitting the metrics that we had envisioned. I just respond to what Dali just said about having academics because Dali did a lot of that work at Jigsaw. Um, she set up a lot of infrastructure for that. So there's a lot of benefits to that. One is you have a, a source of knowledge that's coming to you from people who are experts who have been really spending years, even decades into this space. So you get to ride on on that wave, um, stand on the shoulder of the giant. But at the same time, you have these as your collaborators, right? And they can help make the case for you, right? When they see that there's an impact that is that this work is having, and you're having struggle and you're struggling in showing that impact to your stakeholders, they can be your voices. They can be the independent voices that that are your partners there, and that can that can sometimes help. Yeah, this was this was super interesting. Thanks for sharing, especially the part about you know if nothing bad is happening, how do you show your impact when you're stopping the bad thing from happening? Uh, yeah, it kind of changed my perspective a little bit. Thanks for sharing, uh, and and I guess this kind of goes nicely into the next thing that we wanted to talk about is like the challenges of working in the space. Um, so we, we talked about the good, we talked about impact. So maybe you can kick us off on challenges. Maybe Dali, you can start. Yeah. Um, I think like a lot of the challenges are similar to what we all experience working in UX and especially UXR. A lot of it is this conversation around having a seat at the table, being able to be in those conversations when you're setting up metrics of success. Um, all of those are the same. Uh, something that I read recently and that stuck with me is this idea of like, if you're not given that seat on the table, you bring your folding chair. <laughs> and I really love that. And I feel like that's what we do. We elbow our way in and we sort of like hustle. Um, we're not given that space yet. Um, so we make it for ourselves. So that's one challenge um, that we can obviously learn from each other and, and share notes. And that's why I love going to all the UXR events and learning what's going on across the industry because it helps us too in, in UX for good. Um, but yeah, this also turns a little bit into an opportunity. Um, because the fact that it's not a very established role um like we talked about how difficult it is to prove that you know we're doing all this good but in the end no one has a playbook or an idea of exactly what you should be doing and how it has to happen so if you have ideas and you're passionate and you brought all this knowledge and you have connections with academia and you want to do things um you turn that challenge a little bit into an opportunity because you you get to play and do more things and maybe you would have if you had this really structured role that everyone kind of um, has a predetermined idea of what it's supposed to be. Um, so yeah, we we have some ideas before going into them. Like we, um, Tesh and I brainstorm on, on a few things that you can do in your current role if you want to bring sort of like UX for good um, skills into, into your practice. But before getting into that, what are some of the challenges you think that are top of mind, Tesh? Um, I think, I think Dali said that thing, which I agree with, which is that, you know, as UXRs, we all share similar challenges just because of quote unquote, the ladder we are in, quote, quote unquote, the role that we're in. Um, nobody, nobody really, not everyone knows who we are and what we do. Like I've heard people from hearing UXR and going like, what is that? Is that an acronym for a new you know, TV channel? Um, to, to going all the way and saying, are you the one who makes sketches and mocks for my and wireframes? You know, so there's this lack of education um, that we need to work on. There is no way we can cut corners on it. No one else is going to do it for us we will have to be that 
that person get comes out and educates and advocates people for what we are. Um, so there's that opportunity and challenge of education and advocacy for us. Um, I think secondly is, which is more in particular about UX for good, is that there's not a lot of us, you know, just because there are not a lot of opportunities, to be honest, at the end of the day, if you look at the big pie of all the UXR work that is happening, UX stars for social good, solving societal injustice problems. It's just, to be realistic speaking, in industry, it's a smaller portion of the bigger pie, and there's not a lot of us. So we need to be constantly working on, you know, bridging and, you know, joining hands, finding more partners, you know, creating more opportunities for us and being creative about it. So it keeps us on our toes and it makes me from feeling like I'm a dead vegetable because I have to constantly think about what do I do with this situation? Who can I partner with? Um, I think that's another challenge and would love to grow that, you know, pie together, the big UXR pie, but also the UXR for social good pie. I think we need to grow those two um, much, much bigger. Um, yeah, maybe we can go over some of those, unless there are other questions before, because that's a really nice way of sort of summarizing all the challenges, but also the things that we feel like anyone can start incorporating if they want to incorporate more UX for good. Yeah, and I think, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sure the audience is just waiting to hear like some of the solutions that you have or ideas on how to get involved and not overcome these challenges. So yeah, definitely kick that off. Um, so we worked on this together, so we can we can team tag. I'll go with the first one. Um, so I talked a little bit already about this topic, and I we both agree it was super important. So we labeled it number one, and this is recruiting more diverse people when you're doing your job. And no matter what it is, there's always a group that is underrepresented in your space. I mean, if you work in financial tech amazing opportunity to bring the voices of those being affected. I mean, um, uh, yeah, gaming, I, like I mentioned, any industry, there's always more that we can do to represent those either that should be using our product and don't have the opportunity, are not using it, and we need to learn why, um, but are not the white guy in a hoodie that lives in the Bay Area that actually gets to test all of our products and decide what's good and not good. So one simple thing you can do is like open up that pool of people and recruit in more diverse ways. I actually really like the way um, that you, you call it, Tesh. What did you call it? Ah, it's not coming up. <laughs> yeah, I'm up in the next one, um, I guess in the next topic, but you had your first one was keeping up with the North Star. I remember that, yeah. Yeah, keeping up with the North Star. So I think um, this idea again, like that North Star is doing good at the end of it, right? And it's, it's a really hard problem to solve. You cannot do it by yourself. So you need to find partners and sometimes partners don't know that they can be good partners to you. Sometimes because you need to like realize that every corporation, every entity will have a group of people who are really passionate about some of these societal challenges and they don't have an outlet always. And so connecting with them and finding them can be hard. Um, so one of the things to do is if you are stuck finding people, create infrastructures where people can connect and network and meet. In, in COVID, it's really hard. Um, but for example, I'm gonna do a plug, a shameless plug, uh, but I promise it's for a good cause. It's, um, there's a conference called CHI, CHI, Computer Human Interaction. Um, and we do, it's, it's a, I would highly recommend everyone to go. This year, the, the registration fee is super low. The early deadline is still going on. Please search CHI 2021. Um, there, um, there we run this thing called Diversity and Inclusion Lunch, and DALI has done a version of it as well, um, where the goal is to bring in people and share issues that we are facing together, like bring up speakers, they talk about it, there's a lunch being served, so you have an incentive to come and eat 
but also here so there's education going on and generally there's a self-selection bias at these events right people who are curious or interested they show up and that's your hook get them in get the food they get the food you get them um we're doing this year we're calling it blinner breakfast lunch dinner uh <laughs> Uh, we couldn't be any more creative than this. And I'm sorry, I'm imposing this to it's you. It's a good, it's a great event. It's a great event. Um, it doesn't have to be a lunch. You know, it's a global thing. No one is coming to to a city anymore. So you could be in Tokyo, you know, having a breakfast, and you could be in San Francisco having a dinner. And we're doing these live stream cooking classes by award winning chefs. Um, so you can jump in, you can learn about culture, you can learn about some problems, some societal problem. Also, while we talk about food, um, we mix that in. And yeah, and the audience is mostly food. researchers, right? So I think that's one way of solving that challenge that Tesh was speaking out before, sort of like not having community. So this is one of the events where you get to meet a lot of people who if either they're working on the space or interested in the space or part of something that probably will get you to, to grow that community. Um, right. But I found what you call it, Tesh. I found it what you, you said, don't fall prey of post-colonial post colonization, which is many, many things combined. But <laughs> the way that I read that when I was thinking of recruiting, it's exactly your point. I'm like, we tend to think like we are solving your problem let me solve your problem exactly yeah and and it's like no let's bring the voices of those that need to be designing the solutions with us and you get to do that as a researcher but i i don't know if you want to go deeper into that but it's such a good name for it because just recruiting more diverse people sounds really lame <laughs> so i i think i'm going to start using your your words for it I've, I've borrowed it from other folks as well, so it's totally fine. Um, I think I think just one thing there to give a little bit more context is that, you know, we have lived through colonization, right? And it was basically a couple of people of one particular type going to another place, bringing education and enlightenment. And we are still living through the repercussions of all of that that happened centuries ago. and. And we do not want to perpetuate that idea, right, again. So instead of us going and designing something for someone else, let's enable people to design solutions for their problems themselves. Um, let us give them the sketchments. Let us give them the whiteboards. And do this community-based design. Uh, go even a step beyond participatory design, because participatory means like, you are a participant in our in our design process where we control the process. No, it's a community designing it, a solution for itself. And we need to end this post-colonial colonization where we go and solve problems in Asia and Africa. We need to let them solve the problems and help them. Yeah, the, the second thing that I had was very relevant to that, which is something I'm doing proactively with my team and many teams across Google and the industry. It's related to learning about how racism is affecting our practice, um, both as designers and as researchers. So we don't continue doing yeah, um, post-colonialism, systemic racism, um, how all those things affect the decisions that we make as designers. Everyone I think will benefit from just being more aware. Um, and we can share links afterwards, but a group of people doing this type of work of redesigning um, our systems and especially trying to redesign systems that are systemically racist. It's a creative reaction lab and they have workshops and they also have scholarships and things on where they train people on how to do more of this co-design and community design um, skills in UX. So I think that's one very tactical thing and, and um, special thing that we can do to incorporate more UX for good in our practice. What's the next? I think oh, Daddy, Daddy also had a good one about NGOs, volunteering time. I think it's good if you can talk about it as well. Yeah, this is something I also do a lot of just chats and coffees with people that want to learn more about UX for good. And there's a huge opportunity right on um, donating your time. So there's lots of different groups um, in the different areas that you might be interested in, in volunteering. But actually, they usually have a website that needs help. 
they have some uh, product or something that they need research on. And it's a great way of learning about the space, you know, building a portfolio in a different area that you haven't been working on. Um, it's great for them to get the amazing UX thinking that you bring to the table. And if you want to make this more of your career and try to work in one of those really small spaces that Tesh was working talking about, um, you start creating opportunities for yourself by, by meeting the right people in the space. So that's one idea. Um, super, I know a super tactical thing, but and we'll share the link. There's a um, really great community. It's a Google group called Design Gigs for Good. And they, I think I get emails from them like almost daily. There are tons of opportunities, both in a contract capacity, but also full time. And it's just a great community. The more opportunities we have to sort of like help each other, it, that's just one of them that you can borrow. Yeah, I think that's a really good one. There's also one community that I'm part of. It's called Develop for Good. Um, and they also send out these, um, uh, these newsletters, like I just got theirs today, the one that is from today talks about the AAPI hate, um, which is real, by the way. Um, if there's anyone who believes that this is not real, this is very real. I witnessed it myself yesterday on a bus ride. Um, so um, please, if you can, please work in this space. <laughs> there's a lot more to be done around there. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's one that we talked about that it might be more also relevant, even if you want to venture out and join all these groups. Um, but something that, and we talked a little bit about this before, sort of really understanding what's going on with your product, or even if it's something not going on now, but trying to explore what could be those unhappy flows, right? Like the, the dark patterns or the, the opportunities of badness within your product. And I think that's something we as UX researchers have the responsibility. It's good for business, right? Like learning actually what people are doing and then trying to direct and steer the teams if we see opportunities for changing things. Um, joining Reddit groups, you know, really hearing, not only doing our, our lab studies and and choosing participants, but but also really having a pulse and hearing what's going on um, and taking responsibility. Like if the product or designing is being used for something that it wasn't intended for, better us to catch it before the news, right? Um, so I think as researchers, we have a unique opportunity to also develop that knowledge and, and bring it in house. Yeah, um, I think Dali also had this great one, which I'll just, I'll just share out is that learning to speak business and I'm just going to say learning to speak business and eng. I'm going to add that eng <laughs> there. Um, and the reason I'm going to do that is because you might be in a team where, you know, the product manager in a, in a stereotypical team, right? The product manager is the most enabled person to make the decisions. They are the key stakeholders, so to say. So you need to speak business so that you can, um, connect with them and, you know, influence them. But in some teams, it might be the engineering lead that might be, you know, the key influencer there. And it might be useful to, to, to you know, speak their language. And I know it's not fair. I know it's not fair <laughs> that the product manager does not have to learn or speak UXR. The engineer does not have to learn or speak UXR. I know it's on you, but I think if you do it, the impact that you will have out of your work will increase significantly and you'll find significantly more joy in your own work. So it's for your own selfish reason, <laughs> do it. And you will end up learning some skills. So um, yeah, good benefit everyone. It's part of that when we said, oh, you know, it's good for business, but actually learning how to translate that into something that makes a difference and has the impact that you want in a product. So you might be the person learning that your product's being used for something that it shouldn't be used for, and there's a huge risk on a particular group of people or whatever, but if you can translate that into how that would affect the bottom line and how we can actually make changes, um, it'll be more difficult. So doing UX for good is learning how to speak business, and it's not easy 
when that's not part of our training usually for researchers and designers. So spending the time, there's tons of workshops and, and ideas that you can borrow, but yeah, spending the time, it's a good skill to have. Dali, there's a really good question by Cosette. Sorry, Sam, I'm taking over your, jo your job. <laughs> of course you are. What's the question? How do you turn volunteer work into portfolio pieces for job searching? Um, do you want to talk about it? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, they're, yeah, they're equally valuable, right? Like as a UX manager um, reviewing portfolios, I don't think I would value things differently if they're volunteer or, or paid, right? It's just about how you tell the story. So really ensuring that you speak about what was the problem? What was your specific role? What was your, your collaboration um, across different disciplines and what was the impact? So I think just having a good way of showcasing that in your portfolio is important, just like it is in any project that you work on. Um, so it also adds to it, I think, by showing that you're super passionate about the space, that you're doing it on your own, and, like, um, and that you're taking so much initiative. And it's not something that, you know, something that we value a lot in the industry is this ability to not have to be told, but find your own opportunities and, and your own impact areas. This showcases that, right? Like you don't have to be explicit. This is not something your manager told you to do. So I think it overall, it just speaks really well if you have a few volunteering projects. Um, yeah, and I'm something that I'm happy to review and Tesh's and other people working, reach out. Yeah, show us your stuff and, and let's critique it and work on it together so you can make it a little more punchy. But yeah, make sure that you include it in your portfolio. Yeah, one thing I definitely want to highlight what Dali said is talk about impact. Because when someone is reviewing your you know your work they really want to see what you did and what happened as a result and to tell your impact as a as the start of your story that because of what you did this is what changed this is what did not launch because you said that or this is what um what work you created for another stakeholder you know or this is what you changed in the strategy or the product um and I think people get attracted to that because they can translate that into how you will use your skills into their team. Um, so um, in some ways do UX on, on who is going to be reading your portfolio and CV. Um, That's awesome. He made it, they made it almost to the hour, so yay. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. You can hear them in the background. No worries. It's uh, like you said, we're all used to it in, in the working from home in, uh, environments. Uh, and yeah, I, I, I know that, you know, you offered folks can reach out if they have work that they want to get reviewed or get advice on this stuff. I'm going to drop uh, both patient Dali's, uh, you know, calendar links where you can fully find and book time with them if you're interested in learning more about this space. Um, you know, are there any other questions from folks on the call? Um, and while we wait for questions, uh, any any you know advice or for uh, like parting words for folks who are getting started on this path from from both of you? Mm, I will say something really short, so I'm not off mute too long. But um, and I think Tash, you wrote this when we were brainstorming. Um, is that we need you. We need everyone. Like the, the things that we mentioned um, are really important. <laughs> Reducing disinformation, um, ensuring there's less harassment, trying to ensure our products are Mama, being used for what we intend them for. And not for bad things. Um, it's part of our responsibility as a collective group of UX people. So keep up the fight. Start now. You don't need to work for a certain organization or a certain team. You can start doing things now to improve. So. Yeah, I agree with that. And I was going to say the same thing that um, sending out an, you know, a part, a message on the mailing list that you're thinking about working on a particular space, uh, talking to your employee research resource groups, if you have any in your, you know, current workplace, might, you might be, you might be impressed and positively amazed by how many other people are there, are there to, uh, to volunteer their time. 
uh, about causes that they believe in. So please, uh, please do that. Um, I see some more questions. Um, so Dali, I'm gonna like read it out while we're managing. Have you thought about partnering with your company's HR department for diversity in projects? Typically, this is a department DEI is housed under and has employee resource groups. Yeah, that sounds uh, that sounds like a really good suggestion. Uh, um, we we do partner with employee resource groups uh, when you know when it's necessary and when it's useful. So I think it's a great great point to find folks within the you know, within your workplace. And I think Tesh, you answered a, a, one of the sky related questions on chat, but just for the sake of those on the call, uh, you know, for those who are either for this year or next year, like if you're a student and you're trying to make it work, any any advice on how you can attend these events, either Kai or others, on on a sh uh, short st shoestring budget? Volunteer, I, no? Yeah, no, I, I think. think yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think I think in some way this is a benefit of COVID. So there's a positive outcome of COVID, which is that conferences are happening virtually, which means you do not need money to travel to a city far flung. You know, for example, Kai was supposed to be in Tokyo this year. Um, so you don't need money to go there. The registration fee is also lower um, because of that reason. Um, there is this amazing Gary Marston Travel Award, which is available for Kai, but also for similar conferences like CSCW or Mobile HCI. Um, these are all great events as well. The, the advantage is that both industry sponsors go there and academic sponsors go there. Um, and if your goal is to find a job in industry, do talk to industry sponsors there. Um, but also talk to academic sponsors because a lot of time what ends up happening is people have been doing a job in academia as a research assistant or as a researcher, and they, you, they are able to use that experience to build up a portfolio that eventually gets them into industry. So um, do not shirk away from those opportunities. They might be actually pretty good opportunities. We, we tend to hire a lot of those folks as well at Google. Um, we just hired one of those in my team. So there, there is a path towards that. Awesome. Um, I don't see any other questions. I know we're almost at time. Uh, I just want to take time to, you know, thank you, Tesh, you both and Dali, both of you for taking the time out. I know it's late there, right? This is y'all are both on Eastern time, you know, taking time to come and talk to us about this complex, complex work that you're doing. Um, and thank you so much for doing this kind of work, right? It gives us a lot of inspiration for folks who are in all kinds of other, you know, UX slash UX research work to, to know that we can also look for this uh, in our teams and companies. So I'm super inspired and I'm sure others on the call are. So a big thank you from me and from UX Coffee Bars um, for participating. Um, I want to be mindful of everyone's time. Um, you know, if you have questions, do do bookmark the Calendly links and 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 drop. Uh, you know, uh, uh, feel free to like follow up with Tayshan Dali. Um, and with that, thank you, everyone. I hope you have a good rest of your Wednesday week and weekend. Thank you. Thank you thank for you having so much. Yes, this yeah. is a great, great initiative to be talking to people and just incorporating more voices. So thank you. Thank you for running the program. Yes, likewise, Sam. Thanks so much for doing this. Like, it's just great to see you again. I'm just so happy for those folks who don't know Sam and I. Sam was at Google as well before, and we have known each other because we worked on, on the same team. Um, also, thanks to Dali's family and the kids in particular who have, who have made it through all this time. So, yeah, to, patiently. To <laughs> yeah, thanks for the shout out, you guys. Have a good rest of your day. Thanks for joining me. Bye. Bye. Bye.